like to give a little background for we have some students here from Nebraska, and especially the high school girls, seniors. The altar here used to be in your high school girls classroom. That used to be our chapel, and when we built Mary Immaculate Church from 89 to 91, Father Dominic came to Omaha, and we were going to give him this altar. I remember that very, very clearly because I had been out of town. I was doing a lot of traveling then, and there's this big U-Haul truck in front of the church, and not only did he take the altar in the, the background, which was what he was supposed to do, but I looked in the church, he had took a statue or two out of my church. <laughs> and I said, Father, we're friends, huh? <laughs> but put those statues back in my church. <laughs> I was thinking, what happens if I was a day late? <laughs> I'd be looking in my church, where did it all go? We blessed Queen of Angels 25 years ago. And I remember that very clearly because they wanted to videotape this, this wonderful event, and it is a wonderful event. And I remember Father said, you want to have a microphone on you so you can hear your words and your prayers. I said, I don't know about this because sometimes I have to whisper to the servers what to do. Oh, no, don't worry. We can cut all that out. Well, as a matter of fact, they couldn't have cut it out. So under my breath, I'm saying, Tell him to get over here right now. Yeah, him. Get him. Out. <laughs> so for, for the next 25 years and hereafter, we can't get rid of the comments I was making. I won't say who, but one of the priests was had a hard time getting a mite around my head. I said, he can't do it. Get Father Casmer. He'll get it on it. He'll do it. He'll get it. He'll get it straight. You know, like. <laughs> so please don't be dissatisfied. We're just trying to make sure it's done right. But I wanted to share with you, uh, you've come a long way after 25 years, and it's a great opportunity this year to rejoice and celebrate. Uh, I was showing some of the students outside how expensive things are here. I mean, it, it boggles my mind that you can have a small lot with nothing on it as 400000 That just absolutely amazes me. I mean, it's uh, just absolutely uh, beyond comprehension, I should say. I'd also like to tell you briefly, uh, yesterday got a haircut, if you didn't notice it, and I was talking to the barber, and this is in Rosamond, and he was a fallen away Catholic. So he's saying, ask if he's cutting my hair, and where are you from, and actually, you know, barbers have to have the gift of gab, you know, that conversational stuff to keep you, you know, interesting, or whatever. But he had told me he was a fallen away Catholic, and he was said that he was very confused about what is the true religion, what is the true church, what he should do in life. He's from Los Angeles, but he's moved up to Rosamond. And I know I only have just a couple of minutes. So I just told him, I said, it's not like God would show us the true religion without giving us the proof, the help, the evidence to know what is the true religion. I said, there's a lot of religions out there. And they're all man-made except for one religion. And that one religion is a religion revealed through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I said all of history is centered around the life of Christ. It is 2018. That means 2018 years since the birth of Christ. His life is the focal point of all history. Now, why do we do that? I was getting him to think, and he's cutting my hair, and, you know, I said, when we read in sacred scripture about the miracles that Jesus worked, those are most extraordinary. Raising people from the dead, giving sight to the blind, curing lepers who are, clean, who are covered with sores and decaying, and they were instantly cleansed. People that were crippled could walk again. And our Lord did this multiple times in front of everybody. That's not something you could lie about and get away with. When Jesus' apostles and disciples went out and preached about our Lord, people were just as skeptical as they are today. Prove it. Where is the evidence? But they didn't have to do that because 
These things were witnessed by many, many, many people. And when the apostles preached about the miracles of Christ, even Jesus' enemies could not deny that he did those things. The Pharisees and the scribes who rejected Jesus and called for his crucifixion brought him before Pilate. They said horrible things about Christ, horrible things about our Blessed Mother. But the amazing thing, when we read today their writings, the amazing thing is that they never denied the miracles. Now his enemies, if Jesus never worked those miracles, his enemies would have been the first ones to say, he never did those things. This thing never happened. But they didn't. And why? Because they couldn't. It was publicly witnessed by many, many people. As you know, we're celebrating our Lord's resurrection during this Easter time. Our Lord died on the cross to redeem us from our sins and open the gates of heaven. But as he had foretold, on the third day he would rise again. The amazing thing is, his apostles, his disciples, over 500 brethren saw him risen from the dead. These same men and women laid down their lives, shed their blood and testimony for his resurrection, that they saw him risen from the dead. Christianity spread far and wide, rapidly. The more the Roman emperors tried to extinguish Christianity, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the Christians. It's a spread. And not only that, but the early Christians, they also worked miracles to show the evidence of God's hand. A little time from now, we'll be celebrating Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles and Our Lady, and when we think of Pentecost, we're, we're, we're marveling at how God assisted the apostles. They had the gift of tongues. They could speak, and the people understood them. St. Peter spoke on Pentecost, and there were people from all over the world in Jerusalem there to celebrate the Old Testament feast of Pentecost when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. But this was the new, this was the new Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Ghost. And as St. Peter spoke, they were in amazement. They say, how is it that we can all understand him? And there were 3,000 baptized at first Pentecost. And they went back to their countries. And the amazing thing is the apostles then went out and preached and founded churches all over the world. That is an amazing thing. I think we shared with you in years past, maybe even last year, that our Catholic faith, our faith in Christ we also have miracles that we can see today. One of the beautiful miracles are the incorrupt bodies of the saints. There are some men and women who live very, very holy lives, and God wants to show his pleasure and their holiness of life by preserving their body from corruption. There is a book called The Incorruptibles, and and it documents all these saints. Now, you don't have to go to Europe and see these for in person. I, I, I think some of you maybe traveled to Europe, but I remember seeing St. Bernadette, who Our Lady appeared to at Lourdes, as if he's sleeping right under the altar there. I mean, just sleeping there. Perfect condition. She looks beautiful. St. Catherine Labouré in Paris. In fact, St. Catherine's eyes are slightly opened, so you can see she has blue eyes. If that isn't spectacular, I tell the kids in school, you try holding your eyes open for about a minute. Your eyes water. Her eyes have been open for about 160 years. And slightly open, you can see. And in fact, her habit was deteriorating over time. So the sisters of charity were going to change her habit. They had a doctor there. And this doctor, he's just stating the facts. And he said when he felt her arm, it was as soft as a human body. And this is just, there's no explanation. It's a miracle. We also have wonderful miracles like Our Lady of Guadalupe down in Mexico. And I think we shared this with you last year. In the 1500s, 1534, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, mother of God, appeared to Juan Diego. And when he appeared to her, he told Juan Diego, go to the bishop and say, I want a church built in this desolate place. 
in Juan Diego saying, my lady, who am I to go to the bishop? I'm just a simple native. I want you to go. Juan Diego, you're my little one. You're going to go and do this. God chooses the weak and the foolish. When he goes to the Bishop Zumaraga, Bishop Zumaraga said, I need a sign. I'm not just going to build a church out in the sticks because you said so. I need a sign. And then we know that the next day, Juan Diego's uncle got sick, Juan Bernardino, and he was going to the church to get the priest to give his uncle the last rites. And he thought, if I go this path, I'm going to run into Mary. So I'm going to go this other way. Very simple, humble man. He runs into Our Lady on this other way. He's a little embarrassed. He says, my lady, you know, you're up early this morning and not quite sure what to say. And our Blessed Mother says, Juan, my little one, your uncle's going to be fine. I want you to go up to the, till, the hill of Tepeyac and give, find a sign to give to the bishop. He goes up there and he finds these roses, these this rose bushes blossoming. Now, there's something more to it than just rose bushes blossoming in the wintertime, which is totally out of season. But these were roses, Castilian roses from Spain. And the bishop recognized not just the roses. When Juan Diego gathered those roses into his, his, his cactus tilma, and he told the bishop, I have the sign. When he put the roses down, the image of Our Lady formed on that cactus poncho that he was wearing. You know all those things. The cactus fiber should have disintegrated after 50, 60 years, and it's now since 1534 that Our Lady appeared. It's still in perfect condition. That cactus uh, fiber on his cloak that Our Lady's image is formed on is very, very rough. And they have examined this and examined it, and they say it's not painted on there. We don't know how it's on there. And yet the image is so crystal clear. And as you know, I think we mentioned this in the past, an optometrist who was going to look at Our Lady's eyes, he said when he shined a light to look into the image, it's just an image, <clears throat> he was amazed that the, lie, the eyes actually lit up like a human eye. So involved and so enthralled was he with this looking at the eye within in the inner eye of the image that he said, uh, would you please look up a little bit higher? And he realized, I'm, I'm looking at an image. It was so human-like. There was a physicist who examined the cloth or the cactus tilma, and he said he was amazed. The, the tilma has the temperature 98.6 of a human body. You know, when we think of our, our faith, God gives us all these wonderful little things to remind us that he is still involved in us and our lives and to reassure us that our faith is true. Well, let us remember this. When it comes to our faith, faith is not just some blind thing. Faith is a firm belief in what God has revealed. And God is proven by miracles and by prophecies fulfilling of future events that were made long time ago. Christ fulfilled those prophecies. Christ himself made prophecies. Those are supernatural events evidence, proof of the one true religion revealed through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The other religions of the world are man-made, but there is one religion that's revealed by God. So with this barber, I planted a seed. I even gave him a tip. I said I'd want to maybe, maybe if he had time, I wouldn't mind sitting down and talking to him because he has lots of questions but is he going to be like Pontius Pilate? Remember when Jesus said, for this reason I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? And he left. He didn't even allow Jesus to answer that question. You know, we have many wonderful graces that we see. People coming around uh, to the true faith. People coming back from a life of sin. God's grace is just a wonderful thing to behold. It's invisible. We don't see it. But I'd like to tell you a story. And those of you who were in Rosamond yesterday, you heard the story. So you can tune out, sleep for about the next two or three minutes. But this story is just a, it shows to me that God is giving grace to those who seek it. So please bear with me. If you heard the story, bear with me. If you haven't heard the story, I hope that you're edified by it. Uh, two Easter's ago, or two April's ago, I should say, I was in 
in Italy, Germany, England, and Scotland for confirmations. And when I was in Scotland, I met a family that had just the most amazing story. The family, I'll tell you their name, is the Amor family, Jim and Margaret Amler. They were Mormons. They had a large family. A lot of kids, many of them were, you know, teenage years, et cetera, et cetera. Jim Amor is a, it was a police officer, and he experienced something really, really traumatic. I don't know. I didn't ask him. But he got post-traumatic stress disorder. He had some issues. I don't know what those issues were. I didn't even ask him. Some place you just don't want to go. Don't want to ask anybody. So he had, I believe, get on medication, and, and he had some episodes where he really got it, like panic attacks or whatever. The Mormon church tell them, you and your family can't come back. You're out of here. And if you know anything about the Mormons, they get totally involved with everybody's life. They get in the church, and they got these activities, and you got these events, and all these social things to keep the Mormons intact. Well, they just got kicked out of all of it. So Jim and Margaret were just very dismayed. Where do we go? What do we do? You know, we don't have God in our life. But Jim said to his wife, Margaret, he said, you know, I've been really thinking about the Catholic Church. One church that goes all the way back, historically, back to Christ. I've been always fascinated, and I think that this is something we should look into. So they went to the modern Novus Ordo Church in Scotland, not impressed at all. But they didn't give up praying, God, show us, where, do we sh- where should we go? What should we do as a family? And on one occasion, Margaret had a dream, the mom, the wife. She dreamt that she was in a garden with a man in a brown robe, and the man in a brown robe was going to tell them which church to go to. Now, when I heard this story, I'm like, I don't know about this stuff. You know, We shouldn't always believe in dreams. Obviously, our dreams are pretty wild sometimes, our imagination, etc. But sometimes God does tell us stuff in dreams. So, long and short of it, Margaret was thinking, where is this going to occur? A man in a brown robe in a garden tell us where to go to church. Well, they came to Southern California for a vacation. And Margaret would always Google, where's the church, there's the church, I'm looking up. And all they found with regard to the Catholic church was the Novus Ordo Church. They were not around here. I think they were a little bit somewhere else. But they kept looking and looking. And they were about to leave back to Scotland, maybe a day or two, and Margaret Googled the church in Malibu, uh, Mel Gibson's church. And if you know anything about Mel Gibson, he has old priests fly in there, old priests to fly in there for the Latin Mass. Well, they went to Malibu, and uh, they got there early, too early. They didn't know what, you know what to expect, and the gates were locked, and they thought, oh, just another dead end. Gates are locked. Let's just go back to our motel or hotel. And then one of the security personnel came and said, hey, you're here for Mass, I'll open the gates for you here early. They'd never been to a Latin Mass before. So they go to their sitting down there, and they're just not sure what they're going to see or what they're going to expect. And here comes out this old, old, old priest named Father Procopius. He's a Franciscan. And I'm thinking, if you know anything about Franciscans, they wear brown robes, Okay. So he's in his vestments, and he has this brown hood sticking out of his, his, you know, out of his chasuble. And Margaret's like, I don't know about this. She's thinking maybe this is the one. So after Mass, Jim and Margaret go to talk to Father Procopius. And if you know anything about Scottish people, they have a huge, huge accent. Very hard to understand. You've got to listen really carefully. And... Father Procopius couldn't understand Margaret because she's crying because when he took off his vestments, he got, after Mass, took off his vestments. He wore a brown robe. Oh, my gosh, she's thinking. And between her accent, Scottish accent, and her crying, Father Procopius says, I cannot understand what you're saying. Why don't you come over here? We're going into my garden. We're talking my garden. And then I was like, you know, (laughs) she was really crying at that point. We're like, this is it. And he said, Father Procopius said, there's one religion revealed through Jesus Christ. Christ founded one church. That's the Catholic Church. But you've got to know, it has to be the true Catholic Church. 
the traditional church. Here's a catechism. You and your family, study it. Come back, I'll baptize you. Now, I think Father Procopius, I believe he's dead. But now Margaret and Jim in Scotland, our priests from Europe, from Germany, go up there for Mass once a month. And uh, we had confirmations for them. Uh, they were just so elated that their search has finally come to a conclusion. They know the religion revealed by God, the church founded by Jesus Christ. And during this time of Easter, just wanted to share one thought with all of you. We have to be like the apostles. We have to spread the true faith far and wide. And we primarily do that by how we live. We have to be a good example to all those who see us. How we dress, dressing modestly, how we speak, our actions, our, our charity to one another, our honesty, our goodness. Let our light shine before men. When people ask us questions on occasion here and there about our faith or they have a question about something, answer it to the best of your ability. And most importantly, let us remember to pray. Let us remember to pray for, for people because there's so many people of goodwill wanting to know they just don't know. They have a lot of questions. I, I never forget when, when I f was first in Omaha, uh, I had Father Brendan. He was in Spokane at the time. He had come to help me out, and he started driving up to Minnesota for Mass every weekend, drive up there and come back. And we had circuits going to Kansas, Colorado, just going every which way throughout Nebraska. And one time somebody came to the door, and the guy was – Obviously a mechanic. He had grease all over his hands, under his fingernails, really dirty. Obviously changing oil, working on car, dirty hands, dirty shirt, dirty pants. And he rang the rectory doorbell and said he wanted to talk to the pastor. And Father Brennan said, no, there's some guy out there who looks pretty grungy. And, and you want me to just tell him to go away? We don't give out donations or something. We don't give out food. We only give out food and clothes. We don't give out any money. I said, no, let's talk to him. I don't know who the guy is. So... I went out there, and he pulled out of his hand pocket $500, and he said, Father, I want you to have this. I believe in what you're doing here with the Latin Mass and the Catholic faith the way it used to be. He said, if, if I wasn't moving to another state, I'd be going to this church here. But I'm, I'm leaving very, very soon. I'll be leaving within the week, but I want you to have this $500. And after he left, I told Father Brendan, yeah, you're very lucky you didn't scare this guy off because you can't judge a book by its cover. Now, there's some people you can say, uh, maybe they're out there to ask for a handout, ask for some money, whatever. But we just remember that there are a lot of people of goodwill, and the world is really, truly enveloped in darkness, and people don't know what's going on. And we have to be that light, that reflection of Jesus, that light to the world. And with a lot of people sitting in darkness, they need our good example. They need our prayers and sacrifices. And they need our guidance. You know, Father Dominic here, he can't be everywhere. Father Gerardo can't be everywhere. It's incumbent on you to spread the faith and to be apostles for our Lord. And remember, most importantly, your good example. And remember of all the good example, most importantly, charity. By this will all men know we're followers of Jesus Christ because we love one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.